everyone. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mid American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain. Excuse the scratchy voice, but if you recognize this guy and you recognize this place, you've, you've been here before. We're back at Chuck's farm and he's gonna walk us around and tell us some of the lovely things that are growing here on the farm. Spring has finally sprung and Chuck's got all the flowers here to prove that. So before we get into our tour and our walk around, tell us a little bit about you and uh, where we can find you. Okay, well, for 27 years plus, I was a vegetable specialist at the University of Illinois. I uh, got involved with herbs along with that. And then uh, the, about the last half of that career, I, I taught home horticulture to non-majors, so I can be pretty much of a generalist. And, and certainly over the course of years, I've had interest in just about anything horticultural that just you can imagine. Um, today, I think I want to talk, start out talking about the, the genus Narcissus. Now, do you know the the uh, the myth of Narcissus? Yes. Yes. Yes, I this, do. This beautiful young lad who fell in love with his own reflection mm -hmm. in, in the water, drowned, and the gods granted him the, the he, he sprouted there as 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 this flower, mm -hmm. Narcissus. Um, I don't know how much controversy there is, but in my mind, all daffodils are Narcissus. Not all narcissists are daffodils. Mm -hmm. There have been up to 50 species within that genus. Oh, wow. It 50, can be kind of controversial. 50 is, a, is an approximation. And when you get into common names, you know, that you, you can have all kinds of fights with, with people about that. <laughs> um, the, the people who want just everything to be simple want, you know, everything they look at to be a daffodil. And... You know, it's not that easy. Most of the common stuff we see, I think you could probably call a daffodil and get by with it, but probably only three or maybe four of those 50 species were, are things that we would necessarily recognize as daffodils. But anyway, um, most people will start out with, and I was tough finding one that was still halfway decent, with a, a yellow trumpet daffodil. Um, the, a King Alfred type. They've been hybridized to the, to, the, to the stage where they may be sold as King Alfreds now, but mm -hmm. I think, like a lot of other, other things, Irish potatoes, uh, mm -hmm. some of the, the baking potatoes, they're russets, but are they, are they still russet Burbanks? Who knows? <laughs> um, but that's a basic one. Okay. Um, they're in the, in the grass, fam the grass uh, area, so they have things in threes. So they what were three sepals... Mm -hmm. And three petals have all kind of turned into a thing I would like to call the perianth. That's this the flatter part at the back. Okay. And then uh, then they have a, a cup, a corona, or uh, a trumpet. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, this would be more of a cup. That one, that oh, one's, I see that, the difference. Yeah. That, that one is flattened. Mm -hmm. um, the pinks are not all that pink, and then as they age, the pink kind of goes away. Mm -hmm. That's a, a pink trumpet, and this is a, a, a pink cup. Um, and you said this one is a cup, and this is a trumpet, just for comparison? Yeah, yeah. that's, that's a, a flattened cup, uh, almost to the point of starting to lead toward being a, a double. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> and that one is one of the few that I remember the name of. That's Binky. I got, name. I, I got that at a garden center in McLean, Virginia, when we were out there visiting my sister's friends, and and she was baking and doing stuff in the kitchen, and I was out in their yard planting daffodils all over their, all <laughs> over their yard there. Well, you've got lots more uh, of these to see, and we're right. going to take a stop in the garden. So why don't we kick off our our Chuck Spring tour? Okay. All right, let's do it. Okay, so we've made our way back over to the garden. Looks a little different than it did the last time I was Right, uh, the chickweed has kind of gone crazy and, and I haven't done any tilling because it's, it's either been wet or cold or both or my aching back has, has held me Something. back. yes. Yeah, and then plus, I, you know, as we, as we know, I was obsessed with the walnuts for quite a <laughs> while and it's been hard to get them out of my system. All right, so th these are the, are the red rhubarbs that I planted last spring. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of disappointed that they're seeding this badly because generally speaking, I thought when they chose a cultivar to propagate vegetatively, 
that went into their thinking. Ah. They, they, they minimally made seed stocks. Well, these don't look too minimal to me. So before they zap any more ener energy here, I'm going to go in and just take them we'll back to the ground. Just take those off. And then You're going to take the whole plant or just where that seed stock was? Just the seed stock, and yeah. then hopefully it'll, it'll focus its energy on growing leaves because they, <laughs> these form... The, the previous year mm -hmm. get vernalized over the winter and then come up so so they don't like continually try to do it over and gotcha. over like and the reason for having these is because they have the red pigment in the in the patio mm -hmm. and if you're really really in need of of of, of some rhubarb you, you can rescue the the ones from off but you of, can't go wrong with a little rhubarb no those are nice nice and crisp and Nice little snack to have. Right. Okay. So and cutting those off. Right. I'm going to do these two just while I'm here. And this allows the plant to not worry so much wasting energy on seed dispersal. On seed, because if anything, we want to dig them up and divide them and, and propagate them vegetatively. Okay. Now, you remember the, the tiny little little asparagus crowns that yes. I got, the ones that, that were about the size of nut cup doilies. Not so tiny anymore. No, they, uh, I surprised myself and did a really good job of weed control. And after you were here in August, they continued to really beef up. And I was really surprised when I came, I came out here to hoe around them uh, a couple of weeks ago and was amazed to see spears already up. Well, in fact, I think I probably hoed a couple off here because I was thinking because you plant them, you know, eight inches deep, mm -hmm. that's the thinking is you, you can cultivate over them, but you can't wait. Gotcha. <laughs> because of the cold weather, I think my, my, my thinking was a little off on that. But, um, and because, <laughs> because I'm a knowledgeable horticulturist, I resisted the urge to cut them off when I saw how beautiful they were because they're, they were this. They were the size of, of grocery store. That's asparagus. the reason I don't grow asparagus because I know I won't be able to wait. I don't want to start something I know I can't finish. <clears throat> well, <laughs> I've let them get this far, so I think I'm going to make it. And they just need to grow up. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fertilize them probably once part part way through the season just mm -hmm. to keep them going. And hopefully they'll get up five or six feet tall, store a lot of energy mm -hmm. in those big fleshy roots, and then next spring when I see these first ones. I can sneak a few. There you go. There you and go. And then hopefully by the, the year after that, we can we can get close to a full harvest. So, um, yeah, this one definitely takes time. This is for the patient garden. And you've got garlic. I do. As, as as we've discussed, I think. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you plant garlic in the fall. Uh, here in Mid America, usually that's like the first to the fifteenth of October. And then it's up and growing first thing in the spring. They're, they're looking pretty good, mm -hmm. just generally. When will you harvest these? July. July. It will vary a little bit from variety to variety, but generally from the 4th of July till about the middle of July is, okay. is, is and, and we talked about that, you, the bottom leaves start to die and you want to do it while there's at least three, three leaves that are, that are alive on the top of the plants. Ooh, good to know. I love little tricks like that. Now, I don't know exactly what these are called, um, but talk, talk to us a little bit about these. Okay, those are the miracle lilies or the naked ladies that we talked about with, the, with the pink flowers on the tall stalk. Yes, stalks. yes. Yeah, they grow up like this. I said they're like daffodil foliage on steroids and it, I didn't lie. <laughs> they're about to flop over because they're getting up toward two feet tall. Uh, stores all that energy down there. Um, if I wanted to dig them up every year and divide them, I probably could have 10,000 oh in, in, yes. in, a, in, a, in a heartbeat. Um, but that's how they, how they happen. They die down, disappear, and then right around the 1st of, of August, zoop, they come up and do what we saw on our last August video. And uh, So did this foliage die back over the winter, or does it stay? It dies back at the end of spring at the end of spring the flower stalks come up last for a couple of weeks then they fall over and go Got away it. and then it's nothing until the very first thing when the frost goes out in the spring you see these things looking like ready to go and pow up and they come so wow that's a lot of growth 
Okay, and then so, this patch is absolutely low. Is there a story behind this and how this well, was planted? <clears throat> yes, over here I had I had rows of 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 daffodils that that I had bought and and lined out and and I don't remember if it was before I got the job in 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 Urbana or when I was still young enough that it didn't matter so much. I dug them all up, planted them in four rows here, and that was the original of it. You know, when I started out, I was tilling between the rows, and mm -hmm. <clears throat> eventually that kind of <laughs> went away. <clears throat> now I have to wait for them to die down because <clears throat> what happened when I stopped taking off the spent blossoms, because uh -huh. that's how I knew I had 3,000 blossoms back in the, in the 80s. Oh my I, gosh, I, you I, literally I, counted. Well, you, I was breaking them off, so what do you do? Wow, um, that's dedication, Chuck. Well, well that, <laughs> that, that, that all ended as I got you know, enmeshed in, in the job at the U of I. And so they've been seeding themselves, which was a kind of a pleasant surprise. Mm -hmm. I don't know that the seedlings, by and large, are anything monumental, but I've, I flagged a, a few that, that I want to dig up, but... <laughs> By the time we get to June, I'm usually so swamped with other things. Sure. So what um, do you think on a day like today when you come out and look at these? You know, a lot of people, why do you grow flowers? Why do you, what's in it? <clears throat> well, in the late 70s, I was living in Manhattan on the island um, and would love to go out to New York Botanic Garden and Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Mm -hmm. At Brooklyn Botanic Garden, they have Daffodil Hill which is just this solid mass of, of daffodils and or narcissus. Uh, and it was just inspiring. And so um, you the, to create the, your own. the farmer in me put them in rows, but, <laughs> but the nature in them has kind of been naturalizing them ever since. Uh, you can see this row hasn't, hasn't survived quite as well. Uh, I blame myself. I'm not sure if that's that's correct. One fall, I came out and was was mowing them down while there was still some green at the base, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if a fungus or something got in through that that oh. mowed surface because a lot of them disappeared at that point. But uh, well, again, so again, if if I could ever motor my, myself to dig them, you know, I could be, <laughs> yeah. I could very quickly plant this 40 acres with, with daffodils. Wow. These mm -hmm. with I didn't realize Ooh. they were out. They get multiples and those are extremely fragrant oh that is pretty yeah. i've never seen one like this before yeah that's one called cheerfulness and there's a, a yellow version called yellow cheerfulness in general daffodils narcissus last a long long time uh, -huh. uh they're they're more or less poisonous so you don't get a lot of things grazing on them the thing that people don't realize is the sap that they exude shortens the life of other cut flowers if you put them in a mixed bouquet. Oh. So narcissus should be their own their own, their own okay. thing because they don't because they don't seem to they don't seem to hurt each other but but they, they can damage some other things but they do last in what the garden. Is, what is that over there? Oh Crown Imperial. Can we go check that out? We sure can. I caught my eye. Crown Imperial Fritillaria Imperialis uh, comes up in the spring, has has kind of a quirky thing when, they, especially when they first come up, they smell like a skunk, oh. and kind of perfume the area with oh, just skunk. But they are just fantastic. Uh, I don't know if they, they still bloom anymore. I, ha I had some yellow ones as well. Wow, those are really pretty. They really Neat are. With the with the flowers facing down. <clears throat> that's that's kind of the the crown effect, the I guess. The crown, yeah. Hi. Oh, and it's got like scary little beady eyes in there. Have you looked inside there before? <laughs> Not so much. Look in there. It looks like a scary little... Ooh, that's... Doesn't it look kind of creepy? you got to get a shot of this. It's inviting a pollinator in there. That is kind of cool. One of my favorite spring flowers is bluebells. In fact, I... my. My in-laws have a great big patch at their house, and I took maybe two or three um, and planted them in my garden. The next year I had six, then I had nine, yes, and they're... so one day I'm hoping my patch looks just like this. They are pro prolific spreaders. Um, in 1970, I collected a few of them at my grandpa's. He was very proud of, of 
the bluebells in, in his grove over the next place over a mile, half a mile up the road. Um, I collected more than I needed, planted a few out here, and they have, the rest is over history. the course of those 50 years, have, uh, have just taken over some, some areas. Um, and every year they come up, um, give you that nice hint of blue. Mm -hmm. It's such a, it's a pretty, it's like an electric blue. Right. It's, it's gorgeous. And, and it's, it's so neat because I have the scillas that come out that are blue. I have the chianodoxes that come out and they're a different shade of blue. I have the, the anemones, the windflowers, mm -hmm. and they're, most of the ones I have are blue. And it's, it's three different shades of blue. And then we get this shade of blue. And so it's, it's, uh. It's really, it's really fun because as you get into the summer and fall, blue is not that common a, a color in flowers. But mm -hmm. All right, now we head to the pawpaw patch. Right. Isn't there a song or something about that? Way down yonder in the pawpaw patch, yes. <laughs> picking up pawpaws, putting them in a basket, picking up pawpaws, putting them in a basket, picking up pawpaws, putting them in a basket, way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. Okay, so I've got three grafted pawpaws. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they were, they felt, they felt kind of expensive at the time, <laughs> but you know, given the, the rarity of these things, it's, it's, it's probably not so bad. They're, they're in a custard ap apple family, which is a tropical thing. Mm -hmm. They're the only temperate version of this. And depending on where you are, if you're in Michigan, they're called Michigan banana. If you're in Indiana, they're Indiana banana. Yes. I don't know if I've ever heard them called Illinois banana, but we can start if, that. If we have a if we have a stand up, we can call them that. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is the flower we're looking at now. These are the flowers. This early spring they come out. They're kind of the color of rotting meat. I think they might have a little little ooded rotting meat because they're attracting carrion mm -hmm. flies to do their pollination. Mm -hmm. Some of the commercial growers will actually get buckets of like roadkill and hang them in their in their pawpaw oh patch to attract the flies which then pollinate the flowers. Really? That's dedication. It, it is. <laughs> I thus far have not <laughs> have not. Yeah uh, that's a commitment. I, I had my first my first six fruits last year uh, I got to eat three of them, and the stupid critters got the other three because they're also attractive to raccoons and possums and anybody else who likes these things. But they're kind of interesting flowers. Um, they won't smell right <clears> now, right? They have to be I, fully open. I'll, I'll risk it. Go ahead. Go on in there. I, I would say not, but I don't know. Nope, not because, yet. Because I, I th you can see they're starting to open, I think, mm -hmm. within... Within a couple of days, if we actually warm back up, uh, things should be good. It'll be, be stinky good. in a few days. This was, this was a beautiful, beautiful tree with a great central leader. And then I don't know if it was the smell or what. The raccoons got into it last year and just broke the top off of it. Oh, it, uh, oh I can see that. Uh, yeah, they really snapped it. Yep. So so, so when will you get to enjoy the fruits from this tree? They're, they're early fall. Early fall. Okay. Excellent. Well, that does it for our spring tour at Chuck's Farm. Thank you so much for letting us come out. We'll have to come out again and do another okay. uh, check-in when everything is up and growing in the garden. And Hopefully I'll get motivated and, and get some, some ground worked up and get some, get some spring in before, spring things planted before it's summer. Yeah, if this weather would cooperate. Yeah. But thanks for showing us around again and thank you so much for watching. If you've got questions for the experts, you can send them in to us at yourgarden at gmail.com or you can look us up on Facebook. Just search for Mid-American Gardener. And now Kay is joining us in the studio and we are going to be talking tomatoes today. Uh, Kay loves to grow tomatoes. We've all, we've all <laughs> talked about that. We know that. She's our heirloom tomato and our herbs lady. That's right. right. Everybody's got their niche on this show. So um, before we get into what you brought, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Okay. Well, I'm Kay Carnes and I'm a Champagne Carney Master Gardener um, <clears throat> and I live out in the country in Mon near Monticello, and which gives me a lot of room to play in the garden. <laughs> yes, yes. So Kay, um, you are a big tomato fan. Yes. You actually you've brought them in on the show several times um, to share with us. So what two varieties did you bring today? Okay, um, these two varieties. This is called amber. Uh, it's an heirloom, and it's a small tomato plant. It'll only get about twelve to sixteen. 17 inches tall. Okay. So this is for your space the, conscious mm -hmm. gardener. <laughs> and it could, it actually could be grown in a big pot. And it produces, um, oh, about two, two inch yellow amber colored tomatoes, but it's, they're very prolific. Okay. 
Um, and this is uh, called an Italian paste tomato, mm. or Italian um, potato leaf tomato. Italian potato leaf tomato. Okay, and that's why I brought these two in, because the leaf types are very different. On the, this is a, a regular tomato leaf, and you can see it's, it's got um, lobes and um, the indentations in the leaves. And this is the potato leaf, and it just has a smooth I don't leaf. know that I would be able to identify that just by sight, um, mm -hmm. because it looks so different than what you would expect tomato leaves to look like. Right, and a lot of people mistake them for potatoes. But the interesting thing about the potato leaf, um, it's, this uh, particular one is a big pink beefsteak tomato. Oh. But the... Um, the gen genetics on this, the genes for this are recessive. So they, it will never cross with another tomato plant gotcha. variety. So it's kind of nice for seed saving because you don't have to worry about it crossing with all. others. Um, but the tomatoes are, are, are like... <clears throat> um, and you know, this they, is, they're big, these are the bigger, mm -hmm. the big boys yeah. for slicing, for burgers, <laughs> yeah, for canning. Um, so that, that's the, uh, the interesting thing about this. That it's and you started both of these from seed? Yes, I did. All right, so um, we're, getting, we're getting almost to where we're wanting to transplant things outside. Um, but can you talk us through just some things to look at on your plants when you know that they're ready to be transplanted? How do we know that they're strong enough? And, and how do you know when it's time to move them outside? Well, I, of course, I look at the temperature, the outside temperature. That's the big thing on tomatoes mm -hmm. in any warm weather crop. So I look to see that it's going to be, the warm, soil's warmed up, and it's going to be warmer consistently. Um, and then when I plant them, I plant them deep, um, and I'll plant them, you know, up stem away. So you're going to pop this guy I, off. I am, because Let's... what tomatoes do is they'll send roots out of the stem, and so <clears throat> that gives you a better root growth and a sturdier tomato. Um, mm -hmm. When I plant them, I dig a big hole, um, and I usually add uh, some compost to the bottom, and I use, I put in crushed up eggshells, mm -hmm because that gives them calcium and that prevents blossom end rot. Oh, and we always get questions about that mm -hmm. too. So mm -hmm. crushed eggshells gives a, the extra boost of calcium. Yeah. So if you experience that, eggshells, yeah. give that a shot. I just have a Ziploc bag and whenever I have, we eat a lot of hard boiled eggs, so I just throw them in the bag and crush them crush up. Crush them up, and, and then, so you'll you'll take this leaf off, you said. Uh, yes. How How far up would you? Oh, probably. That okay, about so that is or, pretty deep. Yeah. That is pretty deep. Um, this one now, this one doesn't have <clears throat> as much distance between the soil and the first set mm -hmm. of leaves, so I won't plant it quite as deep. Um, but these, they're, they're pretty deep in these pots already, mm -hmm. so they're going to develop a good mm -hmm. uh, root system. Now, on with the plant, do you wait until they have... You know, I, I know with some they say wait till they get two sets of true leaves or something like that. What? How do you know when these are ready um, beyond temperature? How do you know when the plant is ready? Well, to go just out? when they get a, a decent size. I mean, these are re actually ready to go in, but you know, it's going to be a while before because of the temperatures outside um, before I plant them. So right now I'm trying to keep them healthy and. <laughs> To pass the time get enough until we light. can get outside. <laughs> yeah. Now, with handling them, um, when you go to plant these, mm -hmm. everyone's got their own way to get them out. But nothing's worse than getting your plantling and snapping it yeah. um, by not handling it properly. So how do you wiggle yours out? What's the best way to get these from? Well, these pots are kind of flexible, so I just kind of loosen them. And then <clears throat> a lot of times I'll take a knife mm -hmm. um, or something uh thin and flat and go around and then just kind of, I turn them upside down, mm -hmm. keeping my fingers between them and just kind of tap them out. Slowly, because mm -hmm. man, I tell you, nothing hurts worse. I know. <laughs> than snapping a stem on something you're yep. trying to plant. Yep. Any other tips for, for gardeners um, as they're putting their tomatoes in? How do you, uh, we talked about the eggshells, but 
How do you uh, ensure success? Well, um, just take care of them, um, space them correctly mm -hmm. so they're not too close together. Um, I actually trellis them. We have cattle panels, and I'm not sure if you know what a cattle panel is, but they're, it's a long piece of fence, okay. uh, but they're um, iron and they, they've got a good um, sized bars across mm -hmm. them. So they're really sturdy. For, just to uh, provide some support? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And um, as they grow, I'll, I'll use cloth strips to tie them to the cattle panels. Oh. Because um, they're soft, and they, but it'll keep them um, upright and so mm -hmm. they grow up the trellis. Now, how many tomato plants are you going to put in this year? Mm, I'm cutting back. I only have four varieties, and I'll probably only do about maybe four plants a Oh, each, wow. So. You are cutting back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, because I normally do, but we just don't eat as, you know, yeah. I can a lot, um, but um, so. we're kind of not don't eat as much tomato yeah. stuff as we used that to. That is cutting back for K. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, right. it is. Well, thank you to for To only start these. four varieties. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks for bringing these in and uh, for visiting in the studio. It's always a pleasure. And uh, thank you for watching.